the invitation from the Buddha is to a renewal, a healing, an inner opening that's possible for each one of us. In these recent months, and actually for a good part of this last year when I've had free time, I've been working on a a new book um, on Buddhist psychology. Um, And it's actually been quite a bit of struggle, um, which isn't usually so for me in writing, and I have to work at writing, but this one's been particularly difficult. Um, I agreed to write it, and wrote a book proposal, and got a contract, and then they paid me. You know, so there we are. So I have to do it. Um, and part of the struggle I mean, it has been how to bring Buddhist psychology alive in some way. Um, when you look in one part of Buddhist psychology, the Abhidharma, there are uh, the texts that, this, that break down the whole of human existence into all its constituent parts and elements, the 28 elements that make up the physical body and the physical world and the 18 different sense bases and the 52 mental factors and the 121 different states of consciousness and the 17 mind moments that exist in each moment of, of uh, perception and so forth. Um, and how they're all interdependent and conditional, and one gives cause to the other. And part of the struggle is um, that it's frankly kind of boring. (laughs) I mean, it's hard to figure out how to apply it. Um, It's profound, but it's also quite abstract, and in some ways also a bit dualistic, because there's the good states and the bad states, or the ones that make happiness and that make suffering and so forth. And so I've looked for some way to bring it more alive. And in doing so, really reflected on the way that Buddhist practice functions immediately for healing and awakening. Um, And so as I speak tonight, this first talk uh, for, for myself in this new year, and I'm happy to be starting 2005, kind of a new possibility for us all. Um, This psychology uh, speaks to a possibility of transformation. Um, And so I'm going to tell some stories from what I've been writing that have helped me anyway bring it more alive and see if that's so for you. In this world of gain and loss and praise and blame and pleasure and pain and birth and death and joy and sorrow that make up our humanity, our human life, and in this human mind that we have each been given, is all possibilities. And Buddhist psychology begins by saying that when we are caught in certain states, the root states of greed and grasping, of hatred and aversion, of ignorance, and of the secondary states of fear and jealousy and conflict and racism, all those kinds of things that come out of hatred and ignorance, when we're caught in what's called the small sense of self, the body of fear, then individually and globally we suffer. And we can look in our own heart and mind how much, ask ourselves, how much in our own life do these forces of fear, of hatred, of ignorance, of greed, of jealousy, and so forth, how much do they actually move us and work within us, and how much suffering do they make for us? And of course, globally, it's immediately visible, whether it's Darfur, or our own prison system, or the tragedy in Iraq. One doesn't have to look but in almost any direction to see the results of ignorance and hatred and greed and so forth. 
At the same time, Buddhist psychology also posits the possibility of living in a different way from what is called our Buddha nature, our original nature, our inner nobility. To see the world wisely and use gain and loss and pleasure, pleasure and pain to awaken, to use the changing circumstances which are always going to be shifting and giving to you experiences both difficult and easy. Anybody not have that? To use these circumstances to awaken compassion and liberation or freedom of heart. Which is to say, as human beings, we have a choice. We can either respond to the world with fear or we can respond to the world with compassion. And if we want justice or peace or integrity in the society around us, if we as individuals cannot find this, the world won't find it. So again, in Buddhist psychology, it's taught that they're not separate, not separate from our own life, the universal that we would wish for the world and the particular, the personal, are completely woven together. How could we make a world peaceful if we can't find peace in our own heart and in our own being? Now, one of the stories that I start with uh, in this book um, begins from uh, my teacher, Ajahn Chah, who was a remarkable kind of psychologist in his own way. Um, we would sit with him in the late afternoons and evenings. He had a little bench underneath his cottage. And around his bench um, would be seated maybe a dozen or 15 monks and nuns. And then a variety of visitors, rice farmers and villagers and uh, government officials and people who'd come on pilgrimage from a long distance away. And he would listen to people, and he was a little bit like a watchmaker. I'd watch him peer at people, and they would talk about their difficulties or their lives. And he would be studying, the way I watch the Dalai Lama sometimes study people, trying to figure out what makes this person tick. So here's a scene. Um, one evening, Ajahn Amro describes, circled around the glow of a kerosene lamp early evening, the group listens to Ajahn Chah. In this particular evening, an angry and sad-faced man, a local tough guy in his 20s, sits just at the edge of the light, reluctant, drawn in, brought to Ajahn Chah because he didn't know what else to do. A few days before, his younger brother, part of his gang, had died of cerebral ma malaria. His heart was broken now, and if someone had hurt his younger brother, he would have gone out and taken revenge. But what can you do about malaria? Somebody said, why not go see the Ajahn, the teacher? So here he is. And Ajahn Chah is seated, teaching now, and smiles broadly as he makes a point holding up a glass to illustrate some analogy. He's noticed the stark young figure in the shadows, and soon he somehow managed to coax him up to the front, as if he was reeling in a tough and wily fish. The next thing you know, they're talking, and a minute later, or five minutes later, the tough guy has his head in the abbot's hands and is weeping like a baby. And next, he's somehow laughing at his own arrogance and self-obsession. He realizes he's not the first or only person to have ever lost a dear one. And the tears of rage and grief have turned to tears of relief. All this happens with 20 total strangers around, yet the atmosphere is one of safety and trust. For although those assembled come from all walks of life and all around the globe, they are united at this moment, this one p moment and place, as brothers and sisters in birth and death and joy and sorrow, belonging to our human family. So there was a sense from the beginning in working both with meditation and the practices of 
presence and wisdom and compa- compassion, as Ajahn Chah taught, that wherever we were, whatever was difficult or beautiful, whatever was alive in our life, was the place of our practice. And if it was beautiful and alive in a way filled with happiness and joy, he would bless people and say, bring this out, bring it to others, make it alive. And if, as if, if, as in this scene, it was difficult, then he would listen to what was just in the center of the difficulty that needed to be known and understood and held in the way of wisdom. And in doing this, the chief tools, if you will, of Buddhist psychology are that of mindfulness or a deep listening and of compassion. And these tools or capacities are, in a way, an innate sensitivity that we have, a felt sense when we touch our difficulties, to listen really deeply with compassion and care, to feel what is the source of our suffering and difficulty, and to hold it, understand it in a wise way, to discover the release in the heart. Now, one of the first things that's necessary to live wisely, to know what's true in ourself, or in fact in the world, is to allow ourselves to see clearly, because we can, and we fool ourselves, we delude ourselves, but actually we can see clearly, um, and when we do, it's remarkable, individually, collectively. In June 1988, the Soviet Union um, government newspaper, Asvestia, the official newspaper of the Soviet Union, um, canceled history examinations, final history examinations, for 53 million students. Reporting the cancellation, the newspaper said that lies had poisoned the minds and souls of their children And the guilt of those who deluded one generation after another with such lies is immeasurable. Today we are reaping the bitter fruits of our moral laxity and giving approval to everything that brings shame to our faces and about which we do not know how to answer our children honestly. We will do so no more. This was on the front page of the government official newspaper. Kind of an extraordinary thing for a whole society that's lived in a denial and delusion and and uh, uh, collusion to finally say this is actually our history. This is actually what has happened. And in the same way, in Buddhist psychology, the ability to see what's true. Let's see, how did Florence Nightingale say it? She said, I attribute my success to this. I never gave nor took an excuse. I just saw things the way they were and spoke them the way they were. When we begin to see the way things are, however painful and pleasant they are, there comes a possibility of transformation in the very seeing and recognition of mindfulness. I had a woman who came on a retreat a couple of years ago who was in the middle of a very difficult divorce a few years ago, one of those messy divorces. Um, And both her husband and then she had had affairs and They had a couple of young children, and he was being very angry and vengeful, and she was upset and grieving, and, you know, they were doing it all through the lawyers. Um, A great style of communication, right? And um, she tried to meditate, and she also was taking different, you know, medications and things. Um, And she was suffering incredibly, and much of the time she was just blaming him. And at one point, we, we sat together, and I asked her, well, is it really all his fault, you know? 
I mean, after all, you pecked him. <laughs> and that already was a kind of difficult thing to tell the truth about. I did pick this person. This is my children's father. And as we sat and as she looked, because she was suffering so much, she became motivated to work with her own mind. And when she felt inside, she could see more and more clearly the fearful and vengeful patterns that caused so much suffering to her. Nothing about her husband, just how much pain it caused to her. And because they were so painful, and she wanted to offer something more to her children, she slowly and faithfully began to let them go, to see that there was another way. But the first step was really to look honestly. Is it really somebody else's fault completely? And in doing so, to begin to accept what's true, to accept it with courage and compassion, and hold what's so with uh, respect, whatever it is. Even the difficulties and the difficult people, as Oscar Wilde says, it is the not the Im- excuse me, it is not the perfect but the imperfect who are in need of love. To recognize what's so, to accept it in a deep way, and then to look deeply, to investigate. The Buddha said, All right, now that you see what's in front of you, inquire deeply into the causes, the roots, the patterns, and into the identity that you take with it. Is this who I am? Is this who you really are? Is this who that person is? In each dimension of our life, this kind of inquiry is possible. The foundations of mindfulness are a kind of mandala of the body and feelings and mind that invite this kind of attention. In the physical body, in the physical world, we begin to sit and meditate as we did, just feeling the breath. And the breath becomes a kind of mirror. You sit down and feel your breath, and in the space of feeling the breath, then if there's tension in the body, it shows itself, or longing, or joy, or creativity. All of it appears because we're present here in the reality of the breath in our own moment. Now sometimes, with this being aware of breath, you can't do it. And then people will come in to talk to me and say, I can't be aware of my breath, I'm a failure. You know, and that's just the old I'm a failure thing. You know that one. Um, And sometimes you can't be aware of the breath because there is too much tension in the body. Or sometimes people can't be aware of the breath because it feels controlled. Or sometimes because there's so much pent-up tears that are here that need to be wept. And so instead of saying, well, you're not a good meditator because you can't be aware of the breath, I get curious. Oh, you can't be aware of the breath. I wonder what's going on. What's cooking? Like this woman who couldn't be aware of her breath and we sat together for a while and sometimes I'll just say, well, forget the breath. Be aware of your whole body sitting here. That's a good place to pay attention. Or sometimes if it feels tight or controlled, why don't you hold the tightness with compassion and just be present for that. You don't have to fix it, but experience what it's like to be controlled. But in her case, as she continued to sit, she said, I just can't be with my breath at all. And you could feel that she was really afraid. So I said, well, feel the fear, be aware of that. Fear, fear, just allow that. And as she did, I said, and let whatever else is with it show itself. Images, memories, whatever wants to come. And in a moment, at some point, came this whole childhood memory of being out in a boat on a lake when she, with a friend when they were eight years old, and the boat turning over, and she wasn't a very good swimmer. And she just about dr- died. She had, you know, drowning, and then she somebody pulled her in and did resuscitated her. And she realized all of a sudden that she hadn't breathed since she was eight years old, really. As soon as she brought her attention to her breath, all that was there. And by letting herself feel it and be aware of it and all the fear and all of that, what happened is she could start to breathe again. 
The breath becomes a mirror. And the body holds our history. And whatever arises isn't good or bad. Whatever arises is saying, bow to me to pay attention, make space for this. Because if we can pay attention to our body in this respectful way, the qualities of compassion and wisdom go stronger. I think about the story of Milarepa, the great Tibetan saint who did all these terrible things as a young man and caused a great deal of misery and death, and then um, found a lama to teach him. And most of you will know the story of Milarepa. It's a famous story. He had to build these stone towers for his lama. And as soon as he finished building this huge stone tower before he could get other teachings, the lama said, oh, no, no, you put it in the wrong place and made him tear it down and build another one up over and over again. And it was really kind of a ritual of atonement that he did this over and over to release from his body and spirit the suffering that he carried and that he'd made for others, a kind of generosity. So I had a man come on retreat uh, a year or two ago when I was teaching on the East Coast at our center in Massachusetts. And he was a hospital director from Missouri, and he'd been involved with healing in all kinds of ways for his life. But he came in and he looked unhappy and depressed and kind of bent over. And as he did, he said this was his first retreat and he'd read about emptiness in Buddhism and he wondered well, you know, how, when he would get to the feeling of emptiness. But I looked at him and I said, emptiness? This is emptiness and depression we're talking about here. So I said, well, why don't you just start by being where you are first and feel your body and just become aware hold your experience with some attention. And he tried to do that, and it was kind of difficult, and he came in the next interview and he was talking about how tight his body was and how much he felt pent up inside, and then at some point, as he was talking about it, he talked about the werewolf. And I said, my eyes kind of opened a little bit, I said, oh, the werewolf, this is interesting. This is not your usual meditation interview. Tell me, I got curious, tell me about the werewolf. So he said, well, it feels like he's in there and he's locked inside. I said, how long has he been in there? He said, a long time, <laughs> you know. And his face got kind of werewolfian a little bit when he said it. So you know how we are when we keep stuff in here. So I said, well, you know, what's he doing in there? I said, he said, I don't know. I said, well, what does he want? He said, he wants to get out, but it was sort of scary. <laughs> I said, well, why don't you just go back and sit with this a little bit, and now that you know he's there, and see what happens. So he came back, a, you know, a day or so later of his interview, and he said, he wants to get out, and, you know, he's hungry. I said, well, what, is he, what does he want? He said, he wants my heart. And the guy was really frightened, and I said, well, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, Milarepa, there's this whole tradition of feeding the hungry ghosts and feeding the demons. I said, um, maybe he's starved. Maybe it's time to feed him. He said, yeah, but he wants my heart. You know, this is right. Um, I said, well, close your eyes and just feel where you are. And there was so much suffering that he'd been carrying for such a long time. He said, how do I get out of this suffering? I said, well, maybe it's time to let the werewolf out. He said, I don't know. But anyway... We negotiated for a while, and finally, all right, the werewolf's going to come out. And he opened the door, and the werewolf came out and kind of leapt at him. He sort of jumped back, and he said, and then it settled down and looked him in the eye just at his feet, and he said, the werewolf wants my heart, but he doesn't want to eat it. He wants me to love him. And he said, I, I, I put my hand on the werewolf, and the werewolf walked around me three times, and then went out the door, went out into the wild, into the woods. We were there. So I said, well, how do you feel? He said, well, I feel a little bit relieved, but then it brings back all these, this great pain about the dogs. And I said, well, what about the dogs? You know? I mean, this is how it works. We carry stuff. And he said, 
he said, and he started to tell me a very sad story. He said, I was a little boy growing up on a farm in rural Missouri, and um, we were a bit outside of town. We had cows and some horses and dogs, chickens and stuff. And sometimes when people had dogs they wanted to get rid of, because we were right along the road, they would just dump them at the place, at our farm. And starting when I was seven or eight years old, my father had me go out and shoot them. And this man loved dogs. He said, I just love dogs. I just, such a connection. He has a few dogs. And then he said, so from the time I was eight till when I was 13 or 14, I had to shoot 16 different dogs. And we did this whole practice where he remembered them and we just held them all in compassion. All that he had to do, and himself as a child, having this gun put in his hand, and all of his child, all the kind of childhood drama came. And we did that for quite a while. We spent some time doing that over a couple of days. And then I listened and looked at him and I said, you know, some things you can do inwardly, and some need more of a ritual, like Milarepa building his towers. Sometimes you need to do something outwardly to to help with the healing, because the pain is great. Would you like to make a ritual for this healing? And he said, oh, very, very much. I said, well then, you know, we talked about how ritual works. It's kind of the outer language that expresses the, the inner psyche's need to rearrange the world, to see it in a whole or a new way. And he found this spot way out in the woods up on a hill, and so the last day or so of the retreat, he said, would you come with me? And we went out to do his ritual. We went up in this hill, in this field, and he had moved 16 big stones and made a circle out of them, the top one for each dog, and had placed a little written thing under the stone for each dog. And he said, it was just twilight is going out, and he said, see the way I oriented this? He said, I want you to see that it's facing towards Sirius, the dog star, because I want these dogs to know that there's some spirit that's shining that's, that I still carry about them. And he wept for a while. And we stood there, and he'd made this beautiful altar, and he lit candles, and he made prayers, and he bowed to each one and asked forgiveness. Um, and then he explained the center of the circle. There was a, uh, a big stone and a little one. He said, that's the last dog. It was a mother and her puppy. And I shot her. And even after she was shot, she tried to cover her baby with her body so that I wouldn't hurt it. And he said, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't do it. And he wept and he wept and he asked forgiveness. And when it was done, we bowed, we felt his place in the earth and the whole world, all of this. And then I said, you know, I don't know that it's finished. I think that there's something more you have to do. In the old Irish tradition, there's um, a saying, uh, a, a, an Irish word called a geish, which, is, which means a soul task. That sometimes when we do something to harm another or some way have entangled our life with another person, um, whether they're still alive or not, there is a task that we have to do to absolve ourselves, to complete this. We owe them something, if you will, from the soul level, if that makes sense to you. And I said, is that so for you? And he said, so, very much so. So we meditated out there, it was getting dark. And then he bowed and he said, um, uh, I, I promise to work uh, half a day a week, uh, half a day a month at the animal shelter near where I live for the next 10 years. Um, and I will support them financially. And if I ever see a dog in difficulty, I will stop and help them. This was his kind of uh, response to that. Um, and then we walked back. And we meditated. We had one more day of practice. And I saw him. He looked so much lighter. And he came to a retreat six months or a year later. 
and it was like looking at a different person. His body was held in a different way. There was some great weight that had lifted from him. So there's a kind of attention that we give to what we carry. This was a great burden in his life. But we all have this in our own way. To see what's true, to bring the spirit of compassion, whether within ourselves or in the environment and the earth. If we want to heal the earth itself, we need to bring this same attention. And then there comes a knowing, a felt sense of what needs to be done. Whether it's your response to the tsunami, as many people have, and so many people in this room anyway I know are involved in different forms of service. Whether it was the movement of the monks I know in the forest monasteries of Thailand when the tropical rainforests were all becoming uh, logged and cut down. The abbots who went out and took their own robes and made a ceremony to make the largest tree in the forest the abbot of this part of the forest and um, place their robe around it and bring as many villagers as they could and make a sacred grove that, that, that would stretch in some cases for a mile or five miles. This is the temple and these trees are the abbots. And use their lives and their role, their sacred role, to bring people's attention to the body of the earth as one would to one's own body. Like Julia Butterfly, who actually was visited a lot by one of these abbots, a friend of mine who's been a, a forest monk for 20-some years, went to Julia Butterfly's tree, um, oh, you know, regularly, and talked to her about, as, as if he was talking to another forest monk or nun, about what it was like to live out in the forest for years and years. It's not easy to do this, to face what is in ourselves. It's so much kind of worldwide, so much more uh, popular to blame someone else, to put the suffering on another person. And, um, James Baldwin, who puts it this way, says, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate and ignorance so stubbornly is because they sense that once hate is gone, they'll be forced to deal with their own pain. And uh, if we really want to heal ourselves or the earth, um, we have to start here. I have a friend who works uh, half the year in Israel and Palestine, and her work as a therapist and a healer and a spiritual person focuses on the healing of trauma. And basically what she's been doing is going and meeting with groups of Palestinians and Israelis separately and then together, and also groups of the media, to teach them about the way that we carry trauma. And if it isn't brought into attention with respect and compassion, then it continues to operate unconsciously and one generation creates the trauma for the next and for the next and for the next, as you can see among the Israelis and Palestinians. And especially she's working with the media because a lot of the images from the media traumatize the journalists and then re-traumatize the people who see them and keep the cycle going. And what would it mean instead of blaming another group or another person to actually have the courage to bear witness to our own suffering. To, for the Israelis and the Palestinians, each to witness our own suffering and the suffering of the other without blame. To say, yes, we know you have suffered terribly as we have. It would be really the only way that peace could come about. Overcome any bitterness say the Sufis, because you have not been up to the magnitude of pain entrusted to you. Like the mother of the world who carries the world in her heart, we are each given a certain measure of the cosmic pain of this world and called upon to meet it in compassion 
instead of self-pity. So the work of Buddhist psychology in this invitation, body and the world, is to be able to bear witness to the sorrows and the joys from a place of dignity, compassion, integrity, instead of placing it on someone else or re-traumatizing ourselves. There comes a kind of freedom. The same with feelings. Pleasant feelings, neutral feelings, unpleasant feelings. And the Buddhist psychology lists you know, dozens of different emotions. And Ajahn Chah would look out, people would come in different states and he'd say, mm, you don't like that feeling, huh? You think they're all supposed to be the other way? You only want pleasant feelings? You just kind of look, is that what you want? You know, well, what do you think? Not so easy. I mean, when I look at my own practice, it took me a long time to learn about the play of feelings in my life because they were shut down a lot. My, my father was a pretty violent and paranoid person. Um, and a batterer of my mother and violent with his children kind of terrorized us in a lot of the time and um, feelings were not a big part of our education in our family kind of the opposite and I remember when my father was in the hospital he'd had a heart attack at 65 and was lying there and was really close to death turned out he didn't die this time but it seemed like he was going to his kidneys were in failure and he was needing open heart surgery and we weren't sure if they could do it and it was all these tubes and things like that and it had taken me years of loving kindness and compassion practice in my own release just to come to terms with the fact that he's my father and I loved him even though he was a very very difficult person so I'm in there and talking to him a little bit you get one person it was those days where you get one person in the ICU and come out and somebody else can go in our family's all there waiting around. And doctors don't think he's going to live. And so at some point after I'm there with him, just sitting, um, I looked at him and I just wanted to say to him, I love you, Dad. Um, and he picked up his arm. He had all these tubes in it and stuff like that. And he brought it up to his nose. And he held his nose as if he was smelling something really terrible made a face and shook his head like that was the worst thing you could ever say. <laughs> you know, he put his arm down. And I just looked at him and kind of nodded and said, okay, this is the dad you've got. This is who he is, right? <laughs> so we weren't really very good with feelings in our family. <laughs> and it took a long time. I remember when I first started to sit in meditation and get angry about things in the monastery because, you know, monasteries like any other community and some people are really nice and some people piss you off or whatever it's just how it happens and I was in, I went to see Ajahn Chah and I said I'm really angry and he said oh good I said, what do you mean oh good he got really interested yeah. he said this is good you can learn about it go in your little hut you know it's hot season close the windows and doors tin roof put on all your robes and you sit there today and just be angry and learn about it, you know, and all the stories he did and she all the things that are wrong, you know. And you get to see the mind and the emotions and the history and all of that. And it was so helpful to not see it as a problem, but to see that it was possible to be in the face of it, to bear witness to it with awareness and with compassion. And to see, actually, that feelings are just feelings. That, that they're not who we are. I'm not an angry person, and I'm not not an angry person. Those are both illusions that anger arises in certain conditions and it passes away, you know. You listen deeply and you begin to see the play of feelings, and then you can ask, is this who you really are? Like the woman who came on a retreat that I write about, who was in the midst of working for, for years with a compulsive eating, eating disorder. And she said, I just, you know, on this retreat, it's so painful. I'm eating and I'm going down. All I do is obsess and think about eating. And she felt so bad about it. And I said, oh, well, this is fine. This is what your retreat is going to be. See if you can hold the experience 
of what you're going through with some compassion. Don't stop. Don't try and change it yet. But instead become interested. And she would go down to the dining room and she'd had her stash of food and she would do it. And I said, and pay attention really deeply and listen, what does it feel like, the felt sense inside as this pattern is going? And she came back and she said, what I feel underneath it is so much shame and so much fear. I'll never be able to stop and I just feel so ashamed of myself. And so we said, I said, all right, let's sit with the Buddha of compassion, Kuan Yin, Tara, the goddess of mercy, and just feel the shame and feel the grief. And then the tears started to come. And what started to happen was that instead of trying to fix it, there came this place of holding in a new way. And I looked at her and she, she said, I feel so ashamed and so afraid. All this compassion... Is this who you really are? This shameful, unworthy, terrible person. Is it who we really are? By opening to what so, there comes a silence, an emptiness, a spaciousness. The tentativeness is, it might be who we are for a moment, this great paradox. But we've solidified it. And in Buddhist psychology, it speaks of emptiness. That whatever is here, it's only here for a little while. And then something else replaces it. And it might come back again. But if you look at feelings, generally they only last for 15 seconds, 30 seconds. You try this if you really pay attention. And then they change into something nearby. So there you are, and you're feeling, I'm really depressed. Okay, and you, if you start to pay attention, depressed, depressed, I feel so depressed. I hate this depression. And all of a sudden you realize 15 seconds later that you're not depressed anymore, you're into hating. I hate this, hating, hating, I hate this depression. I am just so terrible as a person. And then it morphs into unworthiness. Oh my God, I'm such an unworthy person. You know, well that's really depressing. And then depression comes back, right? Think, but oh, I'm seeing it really well. I am getting clear about this pride, pride, right? Now you're proud of it. Right? And you begin to notice that it's not solid, that it's not something, it's not who you are. It's a process that can be seen for what it is. And in this, when you realize it, there comes a space of freedom. So another story. A woman is on retreat last year, the year before, down in Yucca Valley, a first group interview. And we're talking about what happens as you're sitting in meditation. And she's, she's really kind of shy. It looks like she said it's really hard for me in groups. There's like eight people there. I can't talk in groups. And she's quite contracted about this. And I say, that's okay. Just notice your contraction. I'm going to make her talk anyway. But <laughs> you know, be warned if you come on retreat. So I said, that's okay. It's fine to feel like you don't want to talk. You can notice all that. Now tell me, what does it feel like? You know? I said, no, no, I don't want it. It's too hard or whatever. And so we start to talk anyway a little bit. I feel so afraid. I don't want to, you know, when people are around, it's so hard to talk. Do you know what this is about? So, oh, yeah, I know what it's about. You know, my parents, any time, I, I was, always did everything wrong. All the time, so I just don't. Oh, and she was kind of shaking. She got really afraid because she was speaking in a group. I sort of teased her into speaking a little bit and brought it out of her. But she was really shaking. And I said, let's stop for a moment and see if you can find some place in your body where you can just find a moment's place of of stillness or ease or some place in your heart or psyche. (sighs) Take a few breaths. She said, nowhere. It's all just rattled. I can't do it. I said, well, can you get an image of some place that you've been where it feels peaceful to kind of bring that in, make it some sense of ease? Can I? Well, think back, before you were so afraid, even if it's very little, can you remember a moment in your life where you were at ease, where you weren't lost in this identity of being so frightened about what people were going to say? 
And finally she says, crayons. Okay, I say, tell me the scene. She said, I'm like three or four years old. I've got a box of crayons in my hand. I said, great, you can draw a picture. She said, oh, no, no. As soon as I draw, they'll judge me. I can't draw, but I can hold them. Imagine that. I can't draw, but I can hold them. So I said, all right, hold the crayons. Now imagine that you could go out from this room where nobody's there, nobody's going to watch you, and you have the crayons. Then what would you do if nobody was looking? And she looked up, and she said, I dance. She said, I danced like a fairy princess. I always wanted to be a fairy princess. I'd hold my crayons and I would dance. So after that interview, I went out and I got her a box of crayons and some paper. I said, go out in the desert and you can draw whatever you like. And she went out in the desert and then she came back the next day, she said, and I danced. She was 63 years old. So that's the first time I ever really let myself dance. So I'm telling these stories to you because I'm trying to understand them and how they fit with the teachings of compassion and mindfulness and emptiness of Buddhist psychology, what it means to bring it into our own lives in the most immediate way, in the body, in feelings, in the mind. You know, the mind, stories, images, intuitions, memories, perceptions. The mind creates both samsara and nirvana, says Kensi Rinpoche, yet there's nothing much to it. It's just thoughts. Once we recognize that thoughts are empty, the mind will no longer have the power to deceive us. So you sit and meditate, and it's the thought factory. It tells stories over and over and over again. It tells us who we are, how the world is, what's possible. A thousand channels in there, you know. And sometimes you don't get to pick. I mean, you do have the remote, actually. But you don't realize that. You've lost the remote, right? It's really tough. And then there's only the sports channel, right? Or there's the unworthiness channel, right? Or the, my God, the food channel is on, right? <laughs> So, you know, you have to... And what Buddhist psychology speaks to us about is looking at our own mind. To become your own psychologist, says Lama Yeshe, you don't have to learn some big philosophy. All you have to do is examine your own mind every day. You already examine material things every day. Every morning you check out the food in your refrigerator, but you never investigate your mind. Checking your mind is a lot more important. So here we are. We're sitting or we're going through our day, driving, being in our office or whatever it happens to be. And we start to see the stories that are told. And one of the things that the Buddha says is that you can change the channel. You can have a story of revenge or a story of um, unworthiness, or a story of need or obsession, as we talked about, and compulsion. Um, an image the Buddha uses when he's teaching Buddhist psychology, he says sometimes the carpenter will use um, a pin to knock out a, a, a piece of wood that holds the furniture together. He'll use a smaller pin and a hammer to knock that out and to take things apart. In the same way, he said, you can use a skillful thought like loving kindness or compassion and repeat it in yourself when another pattern that's powerful arises again and again. Instead of believing that thought, you can substitute another thought for it. Or you can simply see the emptiness of thought itself. So here's a woman who came on retreat name was Rachel, and she'd been a clinical psychologist for a lot of years and was very well respected for her work. And um, She was good with working with people with trauma because she was born during the war in, in Poland 
And the first six years of her life, there was the extremes of the war and the bombings and the deprivation and refugee camps before they were made it to America. And the rest of her childhood wasn't a whole lot better. But she educated herself, did a lot of healing and inner work, and had pretty much come to terms with her past. She was a pretty healthy person. to trust the teachers, to trust herself. She was particularly allergic to anything spiritual, you know, or religious, and yet she was also drawn to it. And if she was honest, you know, she could feel, she talked about this longing for spiritual meaning. So she told me this and I said, well, that's fine. You don't have to, you know, be in any particular state, why don't you notice the doubt and the lack of trust? Feel what it's like in your body. Feel the experience of where you are with compassion without being so lost in it. And as she did, the doubt grew, which it often will when we pay attention. The fear got stronger. And she came in and as she talked about it, she looked and felt very small. And then she remembered that as a girl, her image of religion and spirituality was a simple one. You know, it was right out of the Bible. God was this big, powerful, bearded guy up there who judged who was righteous and who wasn't. You remember that one? <laughs> but this was also the God who had allowed the war, the killing, the devastation, the loss. And in spite of her PhD and all her healing and her graduate education and years of psychotherapy, somewhere deep inside her, she had long ago concluded that God himself was untrustworthy. And underneath that half-conscious, it was still there. And it came up when we, you know, when she really let herself feel it and let it be present. And then she just laughed. She said, I, I've done all this inner work, and here it is, this whole, this whole childhood image of God. I said, well, why don't you go back and just let yourself be open to the mystery of the spiritual longing you said you have of, of God, whatever you want to call the divine. Just go back and see what happens. Now that you see you had this old image, and that's not real, find out what comes. So she went back and spent a couple of days sitting and walking. She came back to, into her interview, and she was just smiling and laughing. And I said, what happened? She said, I found God. I said, well, tell me, you know. <laughs> where is she, you know? <laughs> and she stood up, and she spread her arms out, and she said, this is God. The whole earth, the plants, the trees, the animals, the human beings, even the stupid ones, you know, <laughs> and the beautiful ones. And I am in the midst of it, and it is radiant and sacred, and this is where God lives, and I am a part of this. And it was such a beautiful moment. Underneath, there was this belief and this sense of the way things are. And just by seeing the mind and the story it tells with consciousness, it's empty, it disappears. And in the openness that is revealed comes the innate wisdom of the heart and mind. Another story. A man came, maybe the last one of these kind I'll tell, to a retreat in a lot of difficulty. Um, he was a very successful businessman. He'd started a hardware store and built his company into a chain of hardware stores that was a billion dollar company. Um, but he also had high blood pressure, tremendous stress. His marriage was not doing that well. One daughter was in drug treatment. The younger son wouldn't talk to him, you know, and he was being sued by a key investor. I mean, his life was a mess. And even though he had a really strong will, it was a struggle for him just to stay in the room, 
just to sit, because all this stuff was going on. And for six days, his mind wandered and his body hurt, and he just tried to be present for his life, his aching body, all the worries, his regrets and mistakes. And one evening in the Dharma talk, I think it was me, told the story of Emperor King Ashoka in India, who was the great Indian uh, emperor of 200 BC. And the, in brief, the story of King Ashoka, he conquered all of the Indian subcontinent, great um, armies and powerful um, uh, king. And in, in this last big battle to conquer the south of India, once the battle was finished, 10,000 people had died. He was sitting on the hillside in a tent overlooking the battlefield where some of his closest and favorite uh, officers had died, and just the carnage. Um, uh, and as he sat, looking at the terrible destruction of the battle, at the far edge of the battlefield there was a line of trees, and there walked very slowly a Buddhist monk. Very peacefully and slowly he could see him, on his way from one village to another. And as this, as Sho, Ashok told the story, tells the story, he said, I looked up and I realized that I who have everything, who have palaces and jewels and gold and wives and soldiers and chariots and everything in the world, was sitting here miserable. And here was this man who had nothing, who looked so at ease, so peaceful, so radiant. And I called him over. And this monk became Ashok's teacher and in some way transformed him. And King Ashok took his army and dismantled a lot of it and said that the army that remained was only there to protect the people of the kingdom. And he erected, you can still find them in the, all the corners of India, these great stone pillars with the edicts of Emperor Ashoka that said that um, the government was... Uh, there to serve the people of India, to build roads, to dig wells, and that every form of religion should be honored one to another, that the, the army was the servant of the people and only there to protect them. And he had a whole wonderful set of the virtues that one would still dream of in modern American society. Um, that were the basis for the most, one of the most wise empires ever ruled in, in the course of the world. So I told this story, and he came in the next day after he heard it, and all of a sudden he said he felt like he knew who he was at this moment. He was King Ashok there in the battlefield, the investors suing him in the you know, daughter in drug treatment, the son who wouldn't talk to him, and all these things. He'd done all this, but there was the suffering. And finally he said, I have to just look at it in another way. And so he began, like that monk, the image of the monk, to hold himself with a greater sense of compassion and peace and ease. And it really helped him. He left the retreat in a, in a much better spirit. And a month later, he called back. He said he'd been doing very well, and then two days ago he just learned that his, one of his oldest and closest friends was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And it was just too much for him. He said, I just couldn't do it. You know, he said, I wept, I just felt overwhelmed. One more thing was falling apart. And so we sat together, he and I just weeping for the suffering of his life and the world and the burdens that he carried, holding it in compassion. And I said, go back and don't try to fix it. Just sit again like a shok as you can. And he said he went home. He called me a few days later. And he'd been sitting, and a vision came. The story of King Ashok came again, and there he was sitting like King Ashok, looking over the battlefield of his life. And he saw the monk coming to him with this great, serene face. And then, to his astonishment, 
As he looked carefully, he saw that the monk's face was his own. And the monk came up and sat next to him on the seat, and then somehow, as it does in vision, became his own body. And he realized, I can do this. I can do this. And his own heart became peaceful in the midst of the battle. And it was his vision. And he kept it with him. Um, And over the year, two years, gradually his life changed. And he became quite famous, actually, in the business community as a benevolent and wise uh, figure, um, as if somehow it really had entered him. To see the Dharma, to see the law, body and feelings and mind and the Dharma behind it, means to see things as they are, to see the way it is. It's like this. This is the way that it is. To be able to breathe, to make space for the way things are. I mean, you might wish for it to be different, but the first step, the first step of wisdom and compassion to say, this is the way things are. Okay, a different kind of story. In Calcutta, when the British colonialists, and we won't talk about the colonies and the problems and suffering that were created in, by the colonial empires, and you know, the whole Middle East was carved up by Churchill and a few others, mm, what, it was in 1922 or something like that, after World War I? Okay, we'll put this line here and make Iraq. Should the Kurds have a kingdom? No, I don't think so. We'll stick them in Turkey and a little bit in Iran. And So there's a lot of legacy of many kinds of the suffering of the colonies. But be that as it may, the, uh, during the British Raj, outside of Calcutta, those who were there decided that they should have a golf course. And it's still there to this day. So there is a a golf course that the officers in Her Majesty's service in in, uh, India had created. And after they created the golf course, nine-hole golf course, and would go out there to play, it turned out that there was one unexpected problem. Monkeys. They would play, but, you know, it's India. And periodically, the monkey would come and grab the white balls <laughs> and play with them for a while and then drop them someplace else. So first they tried to shoo the monkeys away, but that's not very successful with monkeys. Then they decided to build a big kind of bamboo fence around the golf course. But any decent monkey you know, knows how to climb a fence, and it didn't take them very long. So then they decide, all right, we're going to trap the monkeys and move them out. But you know how that works. You move one monkey out, and, you know, another one just comes in and fills in the habitat. It was green, nice place to live. Um, And the monkeys loved to see how excited the people got when they grabbed the little white balls. (laughs) So finally, the club made a new rule, all the normal rules of golf, plus one other one, which was on the wall, and it said, play the ball wherever the monkey drops it. (laughs) That's the way it is. So the Dharma, right. It's like this. This is the way it is. This is the way things are. I wish it were different, but this is actually the way it is. And when we see it the way it is, there comes the possibility of forgiveness and compassion for ourselves and for others. There comes in us a kind of courage that grows to be with life as it is. The courage, the wisdom of insecurity, of acknowledging change in our vulnerability, that it's our human condition. We are vulnerable. Things do change. We can't hold on. And out of this grows a deeper and deeper trust. As one of my teachers said, the mind creates the abyss 
and the heart crosses it. We have all these worries and fears and history and problems, and yet underneath there's something so trustworthy in the heart. We know if we listen deeply what creates suffering and what brings joy, freedom, happiness to ourselves and to others if we listen deeply. And in knowing this, we know it is the same for others as it is for our heart. No man or woman is an island. We are woven together in the garment of destiny that Martin Luther King spoke about. And we begin to trust this deep sense of attention itself and openness. And what comes of this is not a passivity, but a centeredness and a receptivity and a capacity to enter the world. The Zen phrase is with bliss bestowing hands, with the gift of blessings to live like King Ashok and use our humanity and even our suffering to grow in compassion, to care for others, to meet the world and foster justice and integrity and love and freedom. As Mahatma Gandhi says, I claim to be no more than an average person with less than average ability. And I have not the shadow of a doubt that any man or woman can achieve what I have if he or she would simply make the same effort and cultivate the same hope and faith. O nobly born, it says in the Buddhist text, remember who you really are. You were given this life of joys and sorrows, of gain and loss, of change and And you are also given the capacity to be awake in its midst, to live with a free and beautiful heart wherever you are. So let's sit for a moment. It is never too late to start again. We are not bound by our past. It is not who we really are. There is a freedom that awaits us in this moment and the next and the next. So let's end, if we could, with a very simple one-syllable chant, and then go out into the rainy evening. Um, No other announcements. I'll be here next week. And I thank you for listening to these stories. It's also my way of trying to understand how to use them um, as I'm writing, and kind of think about them, to speak them out loud. So... The chant we'll do tonight is a very simple one. In the Buddhist tradition, as I've said often, there's a text called The Teachings of Complete and Perfect Wisdom in 80,000 Verses. That's then summed up in 8,000 verses and in 800 verses. And finally, it's summed up in one syllable. And the reason this syllable is the syllable of perfect wisdom, in Sanskrit, it's the seed syllable. It's called the first and the last sound of life, but most importantly, it's the seed syllable of letting go or opening. As my teacher Ajahn Chah said, if you let go a little, you'll have a little happiness. If you let go a lot, you'll have a lot of happiness. And if you really let go, it will be great. So we'll chant this seed syllable of ah. Um, and then go out into the night. And letting go, by the way, doesn't mean that you get rid of things. It just means that the heart is open in the midst of all things. Uh... Ah, Adhar
Ah. Uh-huh.